Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be with you again. Uh, I trust that you've got your tea or coffee or whatever it is you need to uh, uh, enjoy while we look into God's Word together this morning. Um, yesterday was a beautiful day, uh, fantastic weather. Looks like uh, today and the rest of the week will be a little dreary uh, with rain and gray skies. But uh, thank the Lord for this wonderful day that we had yesterday. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Jamie. I know all of you do too, and I've been reading some of the comments. Uh, Jamie has just given us excellent stuff to chew on this past week. Uh, it's been wonderful to go into the Psalms, uh, to dive into them, to understand them a little bit more. And uh, I thought the, uh, the time on Friday with Jamie and uh, Ian was excellent. And I know Jamie is planning to do uh, another session with Ian, kind of a Q&A time again. And so, we're, uh, Jamie, just want you to know, that, and Ian, that we are looking forward to that very, very much. Uh, the way things are set up now, I'll be on devotions for this week, and Jamie will be back next week, and we're just going to alternate on a weekly basis. Uh, I mentioned the good weather yesterday, and I also want to thank you. Uh, many of you knew that... Uh, Yesterday was um, the time when Andrea and I were going to be with her uh, immediate family to uh, lay to rest uh, her mom. And so we were able, the 10 of us were able to be together at the graveside uh, yesterday, and it was my honor to officiate there. But uh, thank you for praying for her and for us. And uh, we appreciate that very, very much. As Andrea and I were driving to uh, Pickering yesterday, uh, for the burial of her mother, um, we got thinking about uh, how many people in our church have lost loved ones in recent days. It seems as though the last four to five weeks, we have had an unusual number of condolences that have been expressed in our morning worship times. And uh, so this whole idea of grieving and grief has just really been accentuated in our own think thinking, especially in light of the fact that um, it's almost impossible to conduct a traditional, regular funeral service. Um, most of the services now are, are confined to just a few people at a burial site. And, uh, and so we know that many are planning memorial services in the future, and we are certainly doing that for Andrea's mom. But as we talked about this, um, the whole idea of grieving came up. And so Andrea and I, this Friday morning, uh, this week, Friday morning of this week at 8, um, in lieu of our daily devotional time, Andrea and I are going to have a chit-chat together on screen with you, and we're just going to address this whole issue of grief. Because we rec recognize that even if we have not lost loved ones in recent days, all of us are going through some kind of a grieving process at this point in time. Uh, there are other things that we have lost. We have lost the regular rhythm of our lives and uh, things that are very special and precious to us, being able to connect with friends, being able to come to, together to worship. These are things that we have all lost. And so we want to address uh, these kinds of things on Friday morning. So uh, we're looking forward to having you then, and uh, I trust that it will be a real blessing to you. So um, just like our regular format, uh, we're going to pray and ask uh, the Holy Spirit to uh, guide our thinking, illumine our minds, then we'll read the passage, I'll make some comments on the passage, uh, some application points, observation, interpretation, application, and then we'll pray at the end. Let's pray together now. Our God and Father, in the name of, of your Son, our Lord Jesus, we approach you this morning, grateful that he has opened a new and a living way for us. We are just so thankful that we can come into the very Holy of Holies by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we return this morning to the book of Philippians and look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, uh, my prayer for all of us is that you will give to us the illumination of your spirit so that we will understand what Paul wrote and we will know how to apply this to our own lives today. So we give you this time together in your word today. Bless us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So we're looking, as I said, at Philippians chapter 3, 
um, we're going to just look at the first four verses. I'd like to go a little further, but I think we won't have enough time. So Philippians 3, 1 through 4, Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And you remember I focused on that in the last devotional that I gave to you a couple of weeks ago. Rejoice in the Lord. Then Paul adds, It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers or evil workers, who those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the true circumcision. We who serve God or worship God by the Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. And then Paul adds a little personal word, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Okay, what do we see here in this passage? Well, what jumps out at me immediately is, is the extremes that happen here. He begins with rejoicing in the Lord. He commands us to rejoice. And then all of a sudden there's a shift. And frankly, it's an extreme shift. He goes from joy to anger. You can see it, you can hear it, you can feel it in his words. Watch out for those dogs, he says, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. So what's, what's happening here? Why would, why would Paul make this sudden and extreme shift from rejoicing to an expression of anger? Well, we are surprised by these words. They kind of leap off the page at us. They, they shock us. Um, extreme words. So why? I think that the theme here, the thread between the two, the two extreme emotions and reactions, the thread is the truth of the gospel, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul has been writing about in chapters one and chapter two. He's been writing about the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you, if you go, to, go back for just a moment to chapter 1, verse 18, uh, he makes this statement. What does it matter, he says? Um, the important thing is that in every way, whether by false motives or true motives, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And then he adds, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So he's rejoicing because of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, those doctrines that we believe in, those facts about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So this is what he's excited about, but now he makes the shift to anger, and the link is the truth of the gospel. Because in, verses two, in verse two, he's writing about those who are not preaching the truth of the gospel. Now, as I was musing on this earlier today, I, I realized that, that these are the same kind of emotions that I have as a pastor. I, there are things that excite me when I hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. For example, I, I shared with you, I think a week or so ago, about John Harrington in Trenton and how in his small church, 80 to 90 people, they estimate now they have upwards of 300 people who are plugging into their services on a Sunday morning online. And John is thrilled about the fact that he's able to communicate the gospel to more and more people. Um, I think of my own son, Peter, and uh, the fact that Royal York Baptist Church in Toronto is kind of being revived and renewed, and, 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 and they've got a great future ahead of them now for gospel minis, minis, ministry. Um, I think of our, our, of our, of our missionaries, who we pray for. I think of my good friend, Jack, Jack Chan. I think of what happened in my heart when he shared with me a couple of months back that he had the privilege of preaching in the open air in India to 8,000 people preaching in the open air the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whenever Christ is preached, whenever the truth of the gospel is made known to other people, we rejoice. But friends, don't we feel the same way when we hear a distortion to the truth, when we, when we realize that there are others who are 
preaching a gospel that isn't true to the Bible, um, we become very, very upset. I know every once in a while the Jehovah's Witnesses come come down our street and I see them out there and I, I always engage them and speak to them, try to reason with them. But there is another side of me that feels this upset that, oh, they're spreading a false gospel on my street to my neighbors. And I, I think that's what we see here with the Apostle Paul. Uh, I remember when we were in the, Phil the Phil Philippines, I think two two trips ago on these mission trips, and I was introduced to the teaching of a guy named um, Apollo Kiboloi. He's a false teacher. And if you look at his meetings and if you follow him on TV, uh, his message is spreading all over the Philippines and all over the world. But it, it, it looks like a Billy Graham meeting. It looks like an evangelistic meeting. He has all the trappings of the evangelical gospel, but he is teaching things contrary to the truth. And so we, we get upset about that because we don't want people to be deceived uh, by these kinds of things. So, so what specifically is Paul speaking out here about in verse uh, 2? Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, these mutilators of the flesh. Well, just by the very words that Paul uses, we're able to discern very fast exactly who he is referring to. These were a group of individuals, probably a very large group, that were, were moving throughout the, the Roman world at that time. Every place where Paul planted a church, they seemed to follow him. And we refer to them as the Judaizers. That is what these individuals believed, is they they believe that, that in order for someone to become a follower of Jesus, the Messiah, first of all, they had to become good Jews. And so as the gospel spread among the Gentile people, these Judaizers were, were upset that Paul wasn't telling the Gentiles to be good Jews. He was just simply telling them to follow the Messiah. And so they were spreading their false gospel on the heels of what the Apostle Paul was uh, doing. Now, the, the roots of this go back to Acts chapter 10, where uh, we read about Peter taking the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time. He enters the household of Cornelius in Acts 10. And you remember the story. He preaches the gospel to Cornelius and everyone in his household. And the Holy Spirit falls on, on, on them. And, and there's reference made to the circumcised, that is to the Jews who were with Paul, who were believers, that they're astonished that on the Gentiles, the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured, poured out. They didn't think this could happen. They didn't think that uncircumcised Gentiles could become true believers in the Lord Jesus. Well, when Peter went into that Gentile home, that created a big controversy within the Christian church. And so you get into Acts chapter 11, and Peter had to defend his actions before the church leaders in Jerusalem. And eventually there was a, a special council of the church that was called and the leaders of the church gathered. And that's in Acts chapter 15. We refer to that as the Jerusalem council. And it was there that, that Paul reasoned with the leaders in the church that it was not necessary for someone to be circumcised first in order to be saved. You see, these Judaizers were teaching, oh yes, faith in Jesus saves you, but it's faith plus circumcision. Faith plus keeping the works of the law. And so in Acts chapter 15, the church makes a decision and they make it very, very clear that it is not necessary for individuals to become Jews first in order to become followers of Jesus. That was a great victory for the apostle, for the apostle Paul and the truth of the gospel. But Later, we read, for example, in the book of Galatians, and Galatians is all about this, the Judaizers had penetrated the churches of Galatia, and Paul was upset about that. He was angry, and he makes some, uh, some uh, alarming state statements in Galatians 1. In Galatians 1, verse 8, he, he talks about if even an angel should preach a gospel other than the gospel you heard from me, let him be accursed. It's like the Apostle Paul gets out the verbal flamethrower and he wants to extinguish completely 
um, these Judaizers who are teaching Jesus plus. Jesus plus something else saves you. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus the works of the law. That's the issue that, that Paul is dealing with here. And he takes issue with this. Uh, to those who add to Christ things that are necessary for salvation, the Apostle Paul is very, very opposed to this. So notice in verse in verse 2 then, he basically says three things. He says, watch out or look out. And he, he actually, in the original, he uses these words, look out or watch out three times. Watch out for dogs. Watch out for the evildoers. Watch out for the mutilators of the flesh. He calls them dogs. <laughs> pretty strong language from the Apostle Paul. Now, when we use the word dog today, we don't really think of an, ins an insult, but if you call someone a dog, that surely is an insult. But back in the ancient world of the Apostle Paul, the Jews would often call Gentiles dogs. And they did this for a reason. Now, Andrea and I, we've been going for these wonderful walks in recent days, as I'm sure many of you are trying to get out of the cabin and get out of the cabin fever and go for walks. And, and we've been, you know, walking upwards of six, seven kilom kilometers a day. And we're in better shape now than we've been. But as we're going on these walks, we're meeting people along the way, keeping distance, of course, but meeting people who are walking their dogs. And their dogs are beautiful and their dogs are cute. We sometimes strike up a conversation with people about those dogs and ask what kind of breed it is and so on. And people want to engage us and they feel quite proud about their dogs. Well, that's not how, how um, people in the ancient world viewed dogs. Dogs were like coyotes. They were like wolves. They were like scavengers. And um, if you've been to other parts of the world where you see wild dogs, I've seen them in the Philippines and India. And uh, these, are not, th these are not the dogs you want to have in your, in your home. That's what Paul is talking about here. These are dogs that feed on roadkill. They feed on garbage. And so to call someone a dog is to basically call them unclean. And that's what really is getting here. The Gentiles were unclean. And so the Jews would use this derogatory word against them. Paul completely turns it around here. He reverses it. And the Jews were saying, those Gentiles, they don't keep our food laws, our dietary laws. They're dogs. Paul completely turns it around and he says, no, you false teachers are really the dogs. You are outside of the covenant that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he calls them evildoers. And it's an interesting word he uses here, evil workers or evildoers. It's basically a pun that he, Paul is using here. It's a pun on doing the works of the law, evil doers, evil workers. In other words, what Paul means is that he, he, he calls these people evil advocates of the necessity of doing works in order to be saved. So those who put a plus sign after Jesus, Jesus plus, in order to be saved, he calls them evil doers. And I, I, think, I think we need to really focus on this for a moment because um, we need to understand that good works... Don't, mis don't mis misunderstand what I'm going, I'm going to say. But think about what I'm saying. Good works are actually evil works. What do I mean? Well, good works that are done in order for people to be saved are evil works because they are deceptive. They deceive people into thinking that by doing good, by doing the works of the law, they can be saved. And in that sense, they're actually evil works evil doers. And then Paul uses a, another expression, mutilators of the flesh. You see, these, these individuals were obsessed with the, with the act of circumcision, with the very right itself. They were fixated on the mere act. They were fixated on, on this ritual performance that needed to be done. So why is he so upset? Why is Paul so using such strong words? What is the danger here that he's warning about. He says, look out, watch out. Well, he understands that they are detracting from the sufficiency of what Jesus Christ has done. They are denigrating Jesus and all of the work that he did, the finished work. 
that he did on the cross for us. They are declaring that Jesus is not sufficient in order for us to be saved, that we need Jesus plus something more. And that's the reason for his anger. He has a love for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul believed in Christ alone, by grace alone, by faith alone. Now notice verse three. In verse three now, he says, for it is we who are the true circumcision, who worship God by the spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So now he's talking to the Philippians about the fact that they're the true believers. When he uses the word, we are the circumcision, that phrase, he really means we are the true believers. We are the ones who are in covenant relationship with God through faith in Christ. We are the heirs of salvation through faith in Christ. Uh, we are the true believe, believe, believers. We don't have to go the Judaizing way. We have faith in Christ, and that is sufficient. So he calls believers the true circumcision. Now, when we think about this, we, we have to re re remember that the Old Testament prophets, uh, you read Jeremiah, they lamented that the, the, the Jews had outward cir circumcision, but they had never had their hearts circumcised. And they wanted and they longed for that day when God would circumcise the hearts of his ancient people. And those who have faith in Jesus, according to Paul, are those who are the true circumcision. Um, there's an interesting verse in the book, the book of Romans. Let me, let me just read it to you. It's in Romans chapter 2. And, and here the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, uh, verse 28 and 29. He writes, A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Holy Spirit, not by a written code. So here Paul underscores this truth of what true circumcision really is. The circumcision in the Old Testament was a foreshadowing of the true circumcision that God wanted to do in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So here in Philippians 3, he gives three marks now, three marks of, of what a truly circumcised person is. And he says, we are the true circumcision, verse 3. Here's the three clauses. Number one, there's an experience of the Holy Spirit. We serve God by the Spirit. Number two, there is a, a right attitude toward Jesus. We boast in Christ. And number three, there is a refusal to rely on ourselves, to rely on our flesh. We're not trusting in who we are or in what we do. We're trusting solely in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, are, we worship or we serve God by the Spirit, an interesting phrase. You see, when you and I become believers in Jesus, Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are made alive. Well, someone makes us alive. Who is it? Who makes us alive? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes us alive. Jesus talked about this in John 3, that we need to be born of the Spirit. The Spirit regenerates us. The Holy Spirit gives us the life of the Father and of the Son. And that's what makes us new creatures in Christ Jesus. This being touched by the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Our hearts are made right then. Our hearts are spiritually circumcised as it is. And the evidence of that circumcision of our, in our hearts is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit indwells us, he makes us servants of God. He makes us worshipers of the Lord. And so even our very worship, it comes about through, through the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. Secondly, he talks about those who boast in Christ Jesus. And, uh, 
And isn't this true? That when you became a believer, when you, when you understood that your works could not save you, that you were destitute and that you were bankrupt and you needed God and the work of Christ to save you, your joy was no longer in your performance. Your focus was no longer in yourself. Your focus, your joy, your boast, your glory is in Jesus Christ. We become Christ-centered. Our glory is in Jesus. Our boast is in him. We boast in him and all that he has accomplished on our behalf. He alone is worthy. We are not. And so the evidence that this circumcision has happened in our hearts by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit is that we see beauty in Jesus. Uh, we see the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, not in any other face, not in our own faces, not in any other God. We see the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus and we boast in him. And then the third phrase, we put no confidence in the flesh. We realize that there is nothing in us. There is no work that we can do. It is only what Jesus has done for us. So to apply this then to our hearts today, I think this passage leads me to ask all of us a very important question, and that is, are you part of the true circumcision? Have you had your heart circumcised by the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you, are you still trusting in yourself? Do you, do you think that salvation depends on your performance? It doesn't. It depends solely on Jesus. You need to call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And so if you have never done this before, or if you've been blinded to this truth, and if, if God has taken away the blinders from your eyes this morning, I would urge you to cry out to Jesus, to ask him to save you, to ask him to be merciful to you. Believe today that what he did on the cross for you, dying for you, achieved salvation for you, if you will put your faith and trust in, in, in him. I hope you will do so. Now, for those of us who've already received Christ, and we have the assurance that we belong to him, then I think the application of this passage is that we need to be like, like Paul. We need to love the truth of the gospel of Christ Friends, we need to be jealous for the glory of Christ, for anything that would detract from him and what he has done for us, for any kind of teaching that adds to the work of the Lord Jesus. We should be jealous for God's truth and oppose that which is contrary to the truth of the gospel and and. We, we need to defend the gospel. We need to be zealous for gospel truth, just as the apostle Paul was. And so I think that would lead us then, of course, to even pray for those who teach a false gospel, that somehow God would open their eyes. Well, that's Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And tomorrow we're going to dive into the, the apostle Paul. And, and learn some more about him because he describes himself in the following verses and points out that if there was ever a human being who could have trusted in his flesh, who could have trusted and been confident in himself, it was him because he had all of the so-called spiritual um, things that he needed in place. He had the qualifications, but he says they were nothing. And that's the attitude that we should, we should have too about any so-called qualifications that we think we have. But we'll look at that tomorrow. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you so very, very much for these verses from the Apostle Paul. And we thank you today that you have circumcised our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for any who have listened to this devotional today who have never had that circumcision of, of heart, that that supernatural, miraculous operation of grace 
would occur in their hearts today. And they would turn from trusting in themselves and trusting in, in their works, and they would put their faith fully in the Lord Jesus. Now, Lord, we pray for ourselves that you will help us to stand for the truth of the gospel, that we as a church together would be true to the teachings of the gospel of Christ, and we would follow what your word says. Oh, Lord, help us to be jealous for your glory and zealous for your, gos your gospel. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining with us today. Again, just a remi reminder that on Friday morning of this week, Andrea will be joining me, and uh, we're going to be talking together about this whole thing of grieving. I hope you'll be able to join us then. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.